Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Reverend Cameron Trimble. Cameron is the Executive Director and CEO of Convergence, formerly the Center for Progressive Renewal, an organization created to recruit, assess, train, and coach innovative entrepreneurial leaders for the church. She began her ministry as a new church developer, and to pay for her ministry habit, she also owns a real estate company and a software company. Before starting Convergence, she served as an advisor to the Congregational Vitality and Discipleship Team of Local Church Ministries for the United Church of Christ and as Associate Conference Minister of Church Development in the Southeast Conference of the UCC. She has worked with many denominational bodies as they set up systems for church development, and she coaches also new church pastors, new church start pastors in the UCC, Episcopal, ELCA, United Methodist, and Presbyterian churches. Reverend Trimble has served as an adjunct professor teaching church planting and renewal as well as leadership with the Pacific School of Religion, Bright Divinity School, Auburn Seminary, and Chicago Theological Seminary. She co-authored the book Liberating Hope and most recently published Piloting Church, Helping Your Congregation Take Flight in 2019. When she's not working, she'll be found piloting single-engine planes with passengers who love to see this wild, wonderful world from the sky. Let's welcome Reverend Cameron Trimble. Cameron, what else would you like our listeners to know about you? Well, um, the last line is actually what uh, I prefer to talk about more than most anything, which Mm -hmm. is flying. (laughs) It is my my great love, my great passion. Uh, I'll fly anything with wings and preferably uh, at least one engine. Um, uh, Flying's taught me a great deal. So as I jokingly say uh, to the grand eye rolls of my staff. Um, I'm prone to break out in aviation metaphors uh, at an obnoxious level, so prepare yourselves. I'll do my best to follow along. How long have you been flying then? Um, I was lucky in that I was born into a family that um, my uncle was a World War II fighter pilot, and when he got out of the service, he bought a single-engine Bonanza, Beechcraft Bonanza, and so, you know, from the time I was able to climb into the cockpit, uh, I was, uh, flying with him. Um, so it's been a part of, you know, who I am and what I do from the very beginning. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. It's been a good teacher for me. Well, tell our listeners, uh, kind of about your journey of faith and what your path to Christianity has looked like and kind of what it looks like today. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, uh, a couple of years ago now, I was going through a, um, a shoebox that I had found in the attic, uh, and I, I opened it up, and there was a picture of my bedroom when I was growing up. <clears throat> and I, as I was looking at that, sort of out of a sense of nostalgia, I realized that, uh, you know, normal young people, I think, usually have uh, posters covering their walls of like the the latest um, pop icon or Mm -hmm. sports heroes or, you know, people that they aspire uh, to be. My room, uh, which I did not realize, of course, until a couple of years ago, but my room was absolutely covered with images of um, uh, suffering. I had pictures of polluted rivers and uh, starving animals and, um, you know, humans who were uh, in different levels of of suffering. And it wasn't until I saw it mirrored back at me in that way that I realized there was something in me from the very beginning that was deeply sensitive to to the brokenness of our world and something in me that was uh, pulled, wooed even, called into wanting to do something about that, to make that better. Um, And as a young person, trying to figure out how to make a difference. I, uh, I was, um, 
I wasn't necessarily consistently raised in a church environment, but I mm-hmm. ended up uh, with a very close relationship with a man I now call my chosen grandfather, but he was a United Methodist pastor. And, okay. um, and so he helped me imagine a space for myself in uh, Methodism at that point. Uh, and so I began, you know, doing work in congregations uh, really under his encouragement and uh, it, whatever theologian I have turned out to be, I think he gets a lot of the credit for that because as a young young woman, he invested a whole lot of energy into shaping my imagination uh, as a young person. Uh, so I, um, I began, you know, I went straight from undergrad into uh, seminary, mm-hmm. and I wish now I could go back into seminary and do it all over again because... <laughs> I yeah. didn't have anywhere to put anything in myself. Yeah. I had not yeah. lived enough life yet. <clears throat> and so, you know, I went, I took, I took these classes from these brilliant theologians and professors and, um, and I'm so grateful for that, uh, that experience, but it's only now that I'm beginning to understand what they were trying to teach. Yeah. Um, now, it, you know, as I'm entering into the ripe age of, uh, well, I just turned 42. So, so that call to make the world a better place has remained consistent for me. Um, uh, my work in the church has helped me recognize um, both the challenges of institutional religion and the opportunities of this moment of deconstruction mm-hmm. that we're living through, uh, and in my personal life, a um, rediscovery of the mystics and of you know, the, the experience of God instead of the uh, impulse towards institutional maintenance that I think most of us are trained yeah, um, yeah, to embrace. So Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. There's a lot there I'm hoping we'll talk a little bit more about and dive into. Um, talk about a spiritual practice that's been meaningful to you or you might recommend to others. You know, COVID has has been a big deal in that area for yeah. me because you know it, for most of us it, it invited us into this uh, kind of monasticism this repatterning mm, of our yeah. lives that for some of us those of us lucky uh, enough to have a little margin um yeah. and you know like i don't have young children at home and so you know i i'm sympathetic to people who <laughs> for whom this is placed uh, new and unusual demands upon them. But for yeah. me, it actually t- took me out of a lifestyle where I was in a different city almost every single week. And I was just traveling relentlessly and speaking to groups and, and just the pace was so intense. Mm-hmm. Um, so all literally overnight, uh, my calendar cleared. Yeah. And all of a sudden I had open space. And so what happened <clears throat> is that I, uh, I repatterned my days in a way that now I will I will fight to n- not give up. And that is I, um, I, b- I basically re-embraced the pattern of a monastic life of uh, meditation. Mm-hmm. So really clear, committed time for, for, for prayer and meditation, uh, a time of study, uh, time for work, uh, a time for play uh, and community and, you know, being with others and then time for rest. And so that balance uh, has been... Um, fought hard or hard fought uh, to, yeah. to really yeah. get established. Yeah. But what it made possible is a level of, um, of, of creativity in me that I didn't realize was available <clears throat> because, mm. and it's available to all of us. Um, but the relentless pace at which we were living, um, you know, meant we, we existed more in a survival space than a yeah. Yeah. regenerative creative one. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, I imagine that was hard to work through or to get to. I heard this, I don't even remember where, some weeks ago about how, by and large, we're not working from home, we're living from work. Did that make sense? Mm, Yes. Like, because of working from home, it's so, the boundaries have just evaporated, the work-life balance, and certainly I I can relate to that. But. Yeah. The so the funny thing about this conversation that we have nationally about work life balance or globally, I suppose, mm-hmm. is we only start to talk about work life balance when work is burning us out mm. <laughs> or yeah, testing true. our boundaries that's true. or yeah, you know, right? So we never like when we're when we're working in a way that feels generative and fun and feeding us and playful. We don't talk about the 
the drudgery of work-life balance. Um, and so I think that's one of the opportunities for, or one of the questions that this COVID um, lockdown yeah. and <laughs> cultural breakdown that we're living through has, has invited is what is meaningful work and what feeds the soul and yeah. what is, what, what's more dignified for the human journey in the, how we use our time. Um, yeah, that's a great point. There's a pastor, uh, Steve Cuss. I follow, I think he'll air his interview before yours, a little bit for yours. He makes a point that like most leaders, like we don't, it's not burnout. Isn't because of like work overload. Like for most leaders, like we crave the work, we enjoy the work. We're passionate about the work. It's like, it's more like our inability to handle, I think for he'll, he'll say the anxiety uh, or the stress, but usually it's not, it's not just simply workload that overwhelms us. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's talk about, about oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just uh, reaffirming. It is, it is about balance. Um, mm -hmm. And, but I also think that uh, the, the inner awakening that I think every one of us is geared to do, but a few of us say yes to <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that essential work can't happen with the, the relentlessness of the pace at which this modern culture asks us to live. Um, so for a few of us, yeah. it really does cost us deeply. Hmm. Boy, we get, there's so much good stuff here. You're dropping already. We don't have time to, I just want to like rabbit trail off all of it, but we don't have time. Uh, let's talk about your work at Convergence. So first tell our listeners just kind of about the story of conversion, conversion, <laughs> convergence, <laughs> and then the work and mission uh, it entails. Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, uh, so convergence is a is a rebrand actually of the organization that started about twelve years ago now. Um, so I was, so I've been doing this work for for twenty years, which is shocking uh, to mm -hmm. say out loud. And um, w what so many of us were observing is <clears throat> that w when you're working within institutional settings that are a undergoing deconstruction and at yeah. that point we were in you know some of the earlier days of, of this deconstruction process yeah. um the the ability to do innovative generative uh it, you know entrepreneurial uh work in in those spaces was nearly impossible and mm. <clears throat> that wasn't anybody's fault per se that was just the design of the of the systems at that sure. point yeah and uh and I was very, very lucky in that there were some uh, people of influence uh, who also had access to resources who saw that. <clears throat> and so they took a risk and, uh, and said to me and to a, a team that we were building, um, uh, we want to make an investment into creating essentially an entrepreneurial sandbox for people who want to try things that uh, might not get funding in traditional ways or, yeah. you know, to explore leadership concepts and, um, ways of, ways of even embodying leadership that are not necessarily mainstream. Um, and so we want to create this, this, what turned out to be an organization that was relentlessly committed to that, that level of experimentation and, um, you know, to do so in a, in an environment that had some rigor to it. <clears throat> uh, and you know, that we, in a sense, we're serving as the research and development arm for mainline denominational life. Yeah. Uh, that was, that was kind of the dream. And, <clears throat> but at the time that we started it, the, the operational assumption, which we actually inherited, uh, was that leadership development was like this pipeline experience. So you take a person and you, run them through assessments and then you yeah. um, train them, you coach them, you provide mentorship. And then all of a sudden they pop out on the other side with this, you know, spectacular capacity <laughs> to, to lead yeah. brilliantly yeah. in whatever setting they were placed in. And that was never true. That's not, I mean, that's just not true yeah. to the human experience, but it is the byproduct of an industrial age that was really sort of thinking in a factory line kind of yeah. mentality. Um, and so we said yes to that simply because we wanted to say yes enough to get us in the game. Yeah. And yeah. I remember standing in front of a board of directors one time and I said, um, to an organization that was investing us. And I said, uh, uh, we will create 
the organization that you want, if it will earn us the privilege of creating the kind of network we believe we need. Hmm. And at that point, uh, they certainly didn't understand what I was asking for, and I'm not sure I did in retrospect, yeah. but I had an instinct that this, that, that there was a different way of being, of leading, of understanding organizational um, uh, capacity and scale and uh, the way that we could work together that was not encompassed in that, in that vision. Mm -hmm. So about four years ago, we started a different kind of uh, organization that at that point we named Convergence, but that was in part inspired by the thinking of, um, you know, people like Brian McLaren, who I think the world of, and, uh, and, and actually, if you want to really capture the vision of what we were trying to create, his book, uh, The Great Spiritual Migration, really sums up that at that point, we, the, every cell in my body was saying, we are on a uh, massive journey, an exciting journey, moving from organized religion to organizing religion which had mm. massive implications for how yeah. we invest resource, how we understand leadership, how we, um, uh, you know, what we decide to um, hold up as success stories, how we want to shape public policy, what are the justice issues that are pressing um, uh, in this, uh, this move to make this world a more just and generous place. So it really, it was a very provocative moment and we've continued to try to lean into that space with all the programming that we've done since then. I want to ask if I can to, for you to elaborate on that statement, organized religion versus organizing religion, kind of flesh it out for me if you can. Well, it's a, you know, so in, again, in the space in which we work, which is primarily within uh, what we'd call organized religion and within denominational mm -hmm bodies, uh, yeah. which are deeply siloed, <laughs> right. uh, we, yeah. which is really yeah. clear to, to us because we work across all of them yeah. or many of them. And, you know, every one of them is working on the same challenges. They're, they're using similar approaches. Their, mm -hmm. their instincts are complementary, right? But they're not talking to each other, which is a real, a real curiosity. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, those institutions were formed to maintain or to uh, protect the gains made by generations that had come before. And so they yeah. hold identity sets, right? Yeah, yeah. But what's what's super clear about the world today is that we're living in an unprecedented time of global networked, um, flattened relationships that mm -hmm. uh, work far more from an emergence energy, um, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a non-hierarchical, more collaborative um a network space than we've ever seen before in human history. And so those um, impulses that created the institutions that we're holding near and dear are making new demands uh, of the, uh, well, the, the, the needs of today are making new demands on those institutions. Yeah. And so this organizing religion is in a sense, an honoring of um, uh, that the, the, that the journey, that the longing of the human soul right now is for an, a, an experience of God that takes your breath away. That that's yeah. what people, that's what I want. That's what most of us want. It's not to, you know, keep a church building open, but it is to have an encounter with the, the divine in such a way that we are reminded that we are sacred, that we are creative, that we are powerful beyond measure. Um, and therefore uh, have the capacity to create a beautiful world together. And that's a different energy, an organizing kind of energy, a, a, an energy that's on, a, on the move, that moves lightly uh, on the earth. Uh, and so it's just a different mindset, ultimately. Yeah, yeah that's great points you're making. Um, I'm thinking about when you're talking about the siloing that so often happens. I remember talking to a pastor I won't say the, the the denomination or where it was at, uh, who's talking about they're wanting to start like a new church kind of ministry in their, you know, denominational region. And there was like four different na national, within the same denomination, like four different people or silos who they were talking to to start this new church effort. And I just, like, I thought of that word like, 
ministry siloing. Um, it's so interesting. Well, it's a predictable byproduct again of, um, of, a, of systems that are deconstructing. It's a question about who has the power, where mm -hmm. does the money go? Yeah. Um, how will we protect what we've inherited? Um, yeah. you know, so there's a circling of the wagons, if you will, in, in a lot of these systems. Yes. <clears throat> and yes. The, the, the heartbreak for many of us watching this is that, you know, there are some really creative people who uh, want to go out and try something, uh, and they need some investment, but mm -hmm. we ask them to spend their best energy jumping <laughs> through these hoops and for decreased investment. Yes. Yes. Right? So it's not like we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars anymore. I mean, it's mm -hmm. usually, you know, pretty small amounts of money. Um, uh, so it's, a you know, it's predictable, but it's, um, it's sad nonetheless. I yeah. think one of the prophetic acts of leaders who work in these denominational systems and have access to resources is, the, you know, one of the big shifts is that if you've got access to those resources, perhaps an obligation actually is to move as many of them as you can into what feels like the church we want to see 50 to 100 years from now, um, so that we can actually have the the resources necessary to uh, to do the kind of innovating and testing that needs to happen. Okay, so I loved that. It's so interesting the point you make about investing resources, and I certainly am not, I've been very fortunate in my my context with resources compared to a lot of folks, uh, but I've heard from, as I've talked to others through this podcast and certainly, you know, uh, offline about kind of the the hoops, and uh, I was thinking about this, the scientific term, uh, I'm not sure if I can get it right now, centrifugal force versus centrifugal centripetal i'm not a science person <laughs> but if i remember right, like one of them is like the thing that kind of holds everything in when you're spinning it and the other is the force that's pulling it out it yes it seems like to me that it's almost like mainline denominations have been about all the energy is about holding it in um it, and some might disagree with me but it seems like to me that like so much it was being asked of leaders and pastors now to kind of hold it in, hold it in, hold this institution together. And it's kind of really kind of wasting. I don't know if that's a fair word or at least taking away energy that could be used to like grow it and get it out. Yes. Well, that's, that's exactly right. And again, it's predictable because um, these are leaders who've been tasked with protecting the institution. Yeah. And so they're yeah. feeling like they're doing their due diligence. Um, uh, this is an, a ripe moment for an aviation metaphor. But, go, go for it. Uh, yes. So that, you know, the, one of the, one of the early m most essential lessons that I ever learned about flying is <clears throat> every pilot will find themselves in unanticipated turbulence. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and when you're in turbulence, particularly if you're in a small airplane, the, the natural human instinct is to grip the yoke as tightly as you can. That's what I'd be plane, doing. <laughs> yeah, your plane's bouncing all over the place. You're, you know, you're thinking just keep the wings level. You're, you're wanting to control as much as you can through your, uh, you know, your yoke and your rudders. But what actually you have to train yourself to do is to hold the, the, the yoke lightly. To hmm. instead of death grip it, but actually hold it with just two fingers. So good. Yeah. Because at that point, what you allow for is that the plane, which is built to fly, <laughs> the plane then has the flexibility to um, navigate itself through the turbulent uh, hmm. atmosphere, through the, the winds that are, you know, hitting it. Um, and it grants it the, uh, the ability to kind of go with the flow which makes actually for a smoother and a safer ride. Interesting. So as institutional leaders, our impulse in the face of the unknown future and yeah. what feels like declining resources and this, in this uh, fear of scarcity is to grip our yoke <laughs> tightly. You know, yeah. we grip our committees yep. tightly. We grip our decisions tightly. We grip our, uh, you know, our people tightly. And it's exactly the opposite that is needed, that, that to hold it all loosely and to, to almost be playful, to be willing to go mm -hmm. on the ride yeah. um, and to, 
to experience the bumps along the way, not as something that's terrifying, but is actually just part of what it is to lead right now. Um, uh, but to, to hold that yoke uh, loosely means that you're, you trust yourself enough as a pilot or as a leader mm -hmm. in that situation, and you trust your plane, um, and that you trust that uh, both will endure uh, and come out on the other side. Um, and, and you as the pilot will have learned something in the process. So I, there's something to leadership right now that requires a holding loosely and a curiosity and a playfulness um, that, that will make this moment of deconstruction and reconstruction, because we're resurrection people, mm -hmm. we believe there's life, death, and then life again. Yeah. Um, uh, if we hold this loosely, we'll come out on this other side, I think, with something that is beyond our, our imaginations as far as what's possible for a more just and generous world. Um, and, and it will look different, there's no question, but uh, I, I personally can't wait to see uh, what, we, what we all look like and what we're up to in you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now. I love it. I love it. I'm thinking of also to stay with your example. I'm thinking about like I'm really I've really become a student of uh, family systems theory, which I'm sure you're well acquainted with. And uh, one of the one of the teachers I follow talks about how when anxiety is or kind of the 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 kind of status quo in when you're gripped with an anxiety, kind of as you talk about like holding the the yoke tighter is like try harder, try harder, try harder. And that's what we're doing. Like we're trying harder, we're trying harder. And he t and this guy talks about like what's needed is this kind of playfulness like you talked about to just think outside the box and not just so, man, so good. So good. I want to ask you about, uh, this is kind of off script here, so forgive me. I want to ask you about um, this trend we're seeing post-COVID, I'm kind of going way off script here, but looking at your bio about your your side hustle, if I if off, I can use those words, off script are the best ones, so go for it. Yeah, good. The with your your real estate company, and then was it a software company, right? Yes. So, uh, I've read some from some uh, evangelicals, this guy like Mark Dema Demaze, Demaz, I can't remember. Um, mainliners are starting to get into this kind of social entrepreneurship thing a little bit. Um, but as we, as we come out of COVID, hopefully eventually, and certainly um, the struggles in, that we've been talking about here among finances and resources aren't going to get any better any soon. What, it, what thoughts do you have for pastors and ministry leaders around like bivocational ministry? That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of a common word. Um, how to make it all work financially? Well, I don't have great news. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there isn't an easy fix to it. Yeah. Um, uh, because, you know, I think what's, um, what's probably true is that, you know, for many pla in many places, not all, but in many, um, a full-time pastoral position is just not possible. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, um, uh, and and maybe even it shouldn't be. Um, mm -hmm. So so we're under we're, what we're living through right now is the remaking radical remaking of almost every part of our system. Yeah. And the assumptions that underlie it. Um, and uh, what's what's true on the micro, I think, is also true at the macro. Um, and so, you know, just as pastors are trying to figure out how do I make a living, congregations are trying to figure out how do I how do we maintain our institution, our buildings, our campus, our staff, mm -hmm. et cetera? National settings of denominations and regional are trying to figure out how do we fund this thing. Seminaries are trying to figure out how do we fund this thing. So the yep. whole system itself uh, has a financial sustainability problem. <clears throat> and in part, I, I think this is this deserves its a whole podcast or 10 <laughs> just yeah. on this one yeah. topic alone. Um, but in part, uh, I keep going back to, I, I think we've got two critical crises that we're facing. Okay. Um, the first is that I think that the story that we tell ourselves about humanity is not working, yeah. um, which is under, uh, you know, or destabilizing all of our human systems, right? Okay. So it, it, anywhere you look in our culture, we are undergoing some massive deconstruction, reconstruction, uh, mm -hmm. that that kind of uh, energy. Uh, and um, 
what that then invites is, uh, you know, what needs to be created uh, in the midst of that deconstruction that is more honest, that has more integrity uh, around human thriving and human wholeness. And the, what, is, what, what is becoming clearer and clearer is um, that we live in an interdependent world. We are all connected. We are all one. And the danger that denominations face is that this siloed existence has allowed them thus far to live off of their own resources, their own um, capacities, their own imagination. So, so the, 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 the danger right now of our siloed existence is that what, we, what we're effectively doing is cutting ourselves off from the very collaborative partnerships that we need. Mm -hmm. So in order to kind of find our way through this turbulent time, as a pilot, for example, I depend on uh, air traffic controllers to help me figure out uh -huh. what I'm doing in, in that space. I depend on other pilots to report in on, you know, turbulence that they've encountered that I might uh, be encountering. I, when, when I'm in a stressful environment, there's a whole network, a whole system of people that I reach out to, to get new ideas, to, to get new yeah. information. Yeah. Right. And any pilot knows that as long as you've got altitude and ideas, you will be okay. Altitude well, and ideas. I love it. We're running out of altitude in the church, and we, we're we running out of ideas in the church, and that's because we are so siloed. Now, here's my, my sort of provocative call to action. Yeah, I don't think it. we need to be, right? So I think we've got this interesting, um, it's, a, it's a, an interesting moment where um, corporations, uh, government entities, uh, and nonprofits are increasingly collaborating on mm -hmm. addressing the major challenges that are facing humanity yeah, right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're many of us, for example, rallying around the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. I don't know why every church doesn't use that framework for their mission uh, uh, framework. Like, why aren't all the churches thinking about how do we impact climate change and working with companies who are working in that space and, and nonprofits who are working in that space? Or if that church is really passionate about poverty, why yeah. not work with the people working in that space um, and working with other denominations to do something at scale? But this, <clears throat> this um, uh, failure of nerve that we're starting to see across these systems and yeah. a poverty of imagination for what's possible when we work collaboratively across our, uh, across our, the silos that have kept us so deeply isolated. That's what is holding us back in part. Uh, and again, I need to stress it's a little more complicated, of course, but, yeah. Yeah. um, but if we had a story that operated for all of us, that was built on a sense of interdependence, built on a sense of, um, of we're all in this together instead of us versus them, uh, and built on a sense of uh, uh, a a better world is possible, that there is a hopeful uh, narrative that's a believable one, um, instead of what we have been living with, which is one of you know toxic masculinity and white supremacy and mm -hmm. uh, uh, us versus them and the you know uh, and capitalism, frankly. Uh, yeah you know, those are the stories that are really hurting us at this point because they've run their, they no longer have the, uh, the, uh, integrity. And I mean the alignment, I don't mean it from a moralistic standpoint, sure, but they, sure. they don't have the, the integrity to hold together the, the amount of diversity that yeah, we yeah. now get to see in the world. So, um, again, I get jazzed up by this, but a lot of people would listen to this and think, Oh my God, this is terrifying. <laughs> I mean, it is terrifying. Let's, I, I, but I guess I'd say for some of us that, it, that that terror intrigues us and excites us. Um, maybe others want to run away. Uh, with our little guest, uh, I want to make sure. Did I get what was your second crisis? One was the story yeah, of humanity. We've got a crisis, well, we've got a crisis of story and a crisis of silos. Oh, okay, 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 good. Yeah, and and story. I mean, the big human story, yeah. like what we're what we're all up to. Uh, it reminds together, me of how um, we live in relationship with each other and with creation. Have you worked with uh, Dwight Shiley? I've not. He's uh, where's he at? Luther, I want to say. I had him on end of season two, and that's kind of one of his big takeaways. His points was like the 
the I feel like if I'm remembering correctly, was the story was inadequate. Uh, you might check him out. I thought I thought he was quite brilliant. That's um, yeah, great. Boy, there's so many questions I want to ask you, and we're running out of time here. So let me ask, uh, let me ask you two more if I can before we take a break. I think about this. I've invested eight years of my higher education into biblical theological training. I grew up really conservative, so I went to Bible college. And I remember freshman registering for my freshman year, my mom saying, hey, Lauren, I want you to come out with a degree that's marketable. Uh, she had been married to my father, who had a Bible college degree, and seen the, our family struggle economically because of lack of work opportunities. And now, here I am, uh, speaking of 20 years, 20, 21 years, 20 years later, I'm working on an MBA, so I'm halfway through getting finally a marketable degree. And as much as I love, love, love my seminary education, like you, I also think about, like, unless something changes, you're never going to be able to get a job that's going to pay pay enough to pay back your seminary debt. And I wonder, like, what, what does this look like? You know, what's the future, like, of... Theological education. What do you think versus like should we should we be sending pastoral leaders to seminaries? Should we sending them to like business school? Does that make sense? It does. Um, yes, and you're <clears throat> you're hitting on again something that requires a much larger conversation. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so the challenge that we have with higher education in general, <clears throat> but certainly in seminaries and. Um, People going to ministry feel it so acutely because their earning potential is um, yeah. generally fairly low. Is there is this this what has been an unbreakable triangle, uh, and it's uh, I, at each point there's access, uh, cost, and quality. Mm -hmm. And so far, all of the solutions that we have designed for hi the higher education model has only achieved two of the three. So you can have access at low cost, but you compromise on quality. Or you can have high quality and access, but then it's going to be really costly, mm -hmm. right? So, so if you play around that triangle, what we've been trying to do is invent within those, you know, that, that set of assumptions that's yeah. there. What I'm hopeful about is that COVID actually has um, accelerated our willingness to um, to try enough new things that we mm -hmm. can maybe work into the access quality uh, cost uh, conundrum more creatively than we've been able to thus far. Um, so that said, uh, theological education matters. <laughs> and it matters that people have the capacity to dedicate their lives to do that kind of rigorous study. Yeah. Um, so we have to find a way to honor that body of work that also, you know, can feed uh, feed their families and that can therefore feed our culture and our mm -hmm. society. Right. So, you know, interesting, isn't it, that we've created a whole culture that essentially devalues and underpays our artists, our poets, yeah. our writers, yeah. our, you know, um, our, our theologians and the, the meaning makers of our, of our culture. Uh, and, uh, well, and then, you know, we overpay in other areas that I find just so overpay. Yeah. yeah. So really bizarre. Um, so, so whatever solutions we drive out, um, we have to hold that, um, disciplined, creative, risky theological exploration doesn't just matter for the discipline itself, but it mm -hmm. matters for the evolution of the human awakening, if you will, yeah. human consciousness. So there's something very real at stake in that. Um, however, uh, the professionalization of pastoral ministry is is going to fundamentally evolve, and I think technology is going to play a really uh, big, big role in how that gets reshaped. Um, I think the impact of artificial intelligence is going to mm -hmm. fundamentally reshape how we engage in theological conversation and how we run into new ideas in the world. Um, it's going to change how we are able to talk to each other, uh, how we organize uh, friendships and collaborations, uh, and do that kind of exploratory 
work. So, you know, small groups, all the things that local congregations do right now, I think can be done or will be done differently already are being done differently. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I don't have an easy, a simple solution yeah. Um, yeah. in part because I geek out on this stuff so much <laughs> that it's, I get the complexities of it. You know, um, I was reading so, a, oh, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Well, I was just, I was, was just a final thought going to say, oh, and I'm deeply sympathetic to people who are trying to figure out how do I do meaningful work, soul fulfilling work yeah. in the world and get paid to do so. The problem I want to stress though, is I don't think it's with us who are, who experience that calling. I think it's with our economic system <laughs> and our political system and our education systems and our, it's with systems that, um, don't honor that human longing, mm -hmm. uh, but by design, they weren't yeah. designed to do so. And that, uh, we're needing to remake those systems. This is a time of transition. That's wow. If that's one thing we're saying, um, yeah, let me, let me ask then this one last question then. Um, and I'm asking it for me as much as anybody else. <laughs> what advice do you have for pastors and church leaders right now? Um, <laughs> that's, that's a good, a very good question. Um, uh, so I, I think the essential work of faith leaders at this point, and I don't care if it's ordained lay, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't make any distinctions around that. I think the most important thing we can do, um, is to reweave the relational fabric of our communities. Mm. Um, and, and by that, I'll, I'll tell a story that I tell fairly frequently, but I think it, it, it's a powerful image, um, that really helps simplify this for me. Um, Margaret Wheatley, who's a extraordinary, um, uh, sociologist, philosopher, uh, visionary thinker, um, she, in a lecture that I heard a few years ago, um, said that it, it's like our, our culture is working like a centrifuge, uh, which as we were talking about earlier, you know, a centrifuge is designed to pull things intended to be a, uh, together. It's designed to, to separate them by mm. the force of speed. Mm -hmm. And so what she was observing was that um, you and I, even our internal wellness is being pulled apart by the speed at which we're living and our yeah. families are being torn apart and our neighbors, neighborhoods are being torn apart and our, uh, our wider, you know, uh, states, countries, et cetera, however you want to scale that, it's all uh, being frayed by the, the pace at which we're d developing uh, and the speed at which we're living. That G Philosopher Gene Houston said, you know, y you and I have now lived 10 to 100 times the life experiences of our ancestors just three or four generations ago. Wow. You know, it's phenomenal how, f how much we're experiencing right now. Yeah. And so um, Margaret Wheatley went on to say, um, that what's so important is the, that we actually hold together, that we, we reweave that. And, and I would say adding to her, her thinking, not putting words in her mouth, but that I think the subversive act of leadership right now is for faith communities, every person connected in to take responsibility for the reweaving of the relational fabric of mm. their participants of their of the families connected to them and of the communities in which they are situated um, so that neighbors know one another again and that uh, families uh, can be connected in ways that are um, healing and yeah. create safety and security for their children uh, and that people can live at peace in themselves uh, and you know free to explore their own their own development and their own awakening in that way so if I was to say anything to pastors, I would say be relentlessly focused on that. Um, let go of everything else because <clears throat> very little matters actually, if we can't reweave that social, that, yeah. or that relational fabric that yeah. holds us, um, because that becomes the, the, the portal, the currency by which we do all the other things that we are, we say that we're committed to do. Um, because as Adrian Marie Brown says, you know, change moves at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. right now that relational weaving allows for the reweaving of trust. Um, so that would be my advice is, you know, good luck paying your bills, but <laughs> help people, uh, <laughs> help people find themselves again.
Wow, that's so good. Like I'm thinking of the the image of the centrifuge pulling us apart, like literally. I mean, I guess I can't say literally, but I mean, it feels like it at times. We're being yeah. pulled apart. And the idea of weaving us back together. So good. Uh, we could carry on this conversation, I think, for another couple hours at minimum. But uh, let's take a break. We'll come back with some closing questions. All right. We're back with Reverend Cameron, Cameron Trimble. Sorry about that. Uh, Cameron, this has been awesome conversation. Uh, so, but let me ask you some closing questions you can take seriously or not. Uh, but if you're Pope for a day, what's that day look like for you? Um, let's see, what does the day look like? Well, you know, the red shoes come to mind first. Okay. Like you got to uh, have the good bling. Um, uh, so I, gosh, if I was Pope for the day, I actually would, would do some of the things that, that this current Pope has done. I would not do some of the other things sure. that he's done. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a real disappointment in him, but, um, you know, I think climate change or, and, uh, global warming is, uh, is, is a, is a crisis beyond words. <laughs> it, it's yeah. impossible to language how significant it is that we all tune into that. Um, and so I really appreciate, frankly, that this Pope did tune us in, mm -hmm. um, uh, to the extent that, that he did. Um, the other thing though, I would encourage, um, faith systems to think about is, you know, I think about the scripture, be as wise as uh, serpents, but innocent mm -hmm. as doves. Um, you know, a pope can shape an, a collective imagination and, and can really lean into that crisis of story that I talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, I, I would... I would be building partnerships with major media corporations, even in spite of the ways they're compromised. But we need we need levers of storytelling mm -hmm. uh, that can can distribute at the global level. Um, so, you know, I'm like I, I I think it's no mistake that some of our visionaries uh, in our culture have made contracts with companies like Netflix <laughs> mm. um, because. Yeah. It's a way of shaping collective imagination um, for good or ill, but I hope in our case for good. Um, so I would play in that space. I, I would take that seriously that, you know, this is a, a place for, um, for new stories, for fairy tales, for a new imagination to help shape the kind of world we want to, to embrace. That's great. Uh, talk about a theologian or historical Christian figure you would want to meet or bring back to life. You know, because um, because this time has been so powerful for me and so precious to me uh, in this lockdown where I've been home so much, I've I've really turned back to the mystics, mm -hmm. and so I would I would want to um, bring back to life Sojourner Truth mm. and um, Teresa of Avila and Thomas Merton. Yeah. And, um, you know, some of those wonderful saints among us who who were not committed to right belief. Mm -hmm. They were committed to the pursuit of experiences of the divine. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I miss that. <laughs> I would like to see more of that in the world. That brings me back to that thing I wrote it down that people want an experience of God that takes their breath away. Yes. What do you think history will remember from our current time and place? Well, I think that's undetermined. Um, uh, I will tell you the last four years really worried me. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what we've got right now is a the chance to take a breath. Yeah. But I think what happens on the other side of this breath is yet to be determined. Um, so, yeah. uh, I think there's, you know, I think there's a great deal at stake actually in us deciding, um, you know, are we, are we in fact going to, uh, lean into a, a possible world of realized interdependence and, um, equality or, uh, and equity and, um, and justice and fairness and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, consciousness uh or are we going to follow a nativist path yeah and are we going to retrench into you know f fear and uh 
toxic patriarchy and um, you know power systems that are are deeply oppressive. And I'm speaking to you today from uh, Georgia, oh, where yeah. Justin, you know, this past week we've passed what is just an absolutely abhorrent voter suppression, yeah, <laughs> uh, a law uh, passed it into law. Uh, and you know, so I think there's, <clears throat> I think there's something worth fighting for here, mm-hmm. and I think it's going to feel that way. I think it's going to feel like a, a battle, um, but it is a battle. I think for for the waking up of people. Yeah. Um, to a world that works better for all. Well, what do you hope then? What do you hope for the future of Christianity? Um, well, so I'm actually, uh, to answer that, I want to read the last chapter of my book, <clears throat> if I can. Okay. Um, cause I, that, uh, I think says it more succinctly than me just riffing here. Sure. Um, so I said, I'm convinced that a new kind of Christianity and a new kind of church as its earthly expression is emerging in our midst. This new Christianity relies far less on structure and institution. It is a raw spiritual expression of a living, boundless God. This new Christianity is a faith on the move, moving from being organized religion to organizing religion. This new Christianity is kind, generous, brave, and always on the side of the oppressed. It is not theologically agnostic or vague about what it stands for. It supports women's rights and LGBT rights. It welcomes immigrants, values collaboration, seeks love in all of its forms, and is reclaiming the ancient spiritual practices that help deepen our souls. I'm also convinced that this new kind of Christianity is at a tipping point. We face the reality that it will either be a growing movement that reclaims an ancient faith for the common good of all, or it will become a fringe movement with two distinct factions, the progressives who don't matter at all and the extremists who will terrorize us all. Hmm. The choice is ours. That is pretty good. Which book is that from? That is Piloting Church. Okay, well, good. I I didn't give you a good opportunity to plug the book, so I wanted to give her an opportunity, Cameron, an opportunity to plug the book. So the, the book is called piloting church what's the full title uh let me look uh (laughs) helping your congregation take flight (laughs) well where can people find out more about you and find the book um you can go to cameron com, uh and uh you can get access i i produce what i call an almost daily meditation Mm -hmm. um so you can sign up for that there and then uh you can also uh uh you know, learn more about what I'm up to in the world and then also uh, purchase any of the books that I've written um, in that space. Well, this has been such a great conversation. Uh, thanks for your patience with the uh, the guest we've had in the background and uh, really, really enjoyed it. So uh, thanks again and may God's peace be with you. Thank you. You too. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is produced by Torn Curtain Arts in partnership with Resonate Media. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit futurechristian.com. If you've enjoyed the show and you think it would be valuable for others to hear, subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. That really helps more people find us. Thanks again and go in peace.